Now, emerging market economies are struggling and with South Africans increasingly feeling the pinch, Fenwick thought it would be an interesting idea to ask the experts how their wealthier clients are approaching their money in 2014. Joining me today is Henry van de Venter. He's the head of business development at Axis. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. Now, as I was telling uh, Mark and Christian just before we went live that I tried to type in trillionaire and I kept on thinking I got the spelling wrong and it seems as if Google doesn't even recognize the term as yet. So I'm not quite certain who we're talking about today, but it's certainly no, no, none of us behind the desk today. Well, but if you go to Google Zimbabwe, the trillionaire is actually one of the most popular Okay, dollar terms. trillionaire, right? Okay, great. <laughs> but let's start off with, um, you know, Let's talk about these uh, uber-rich uh, people as against uh, the super-rich, which I'm sure are our billionaires that we have. What are they thinking about uh, in light of uh, the global economic uh, climate that we're seeing now? Well, from an investment strategy perspective, Nausea, it's actually a very interesting question because what we find with most billionaires and trillionaires and the, the uber wealthy out there is that they have made their money in business. And if they want to create wealth, you know, they know where they're going to reinvest. Whereas if it comes to an overall investment strategy, one of the overarching objectives is to make sure you never ever become poor again. It's more about securing lifestyles and managing risk mm. in a way that makes sense which is why you can understand that so many of them are anxious about the current South African environment because certainly we've seen a lot of volatility over the last few months. Um, we don't expect to have plain sailing going into this year, maybe next year for a variety of reasons. So by and large, if you look at the uber wealthy right now, it's a question of how do I ensure that I protect myself against risk and volatility mm. and maybe still capitalize from the few opportunities that are still around. So, so one of the obvious questions is over the last couple of years, there's been this talk about uh, an asset bubble that's being generated within the equity market and, and we, not so much the debate around the bubble but the, the fact that markets have run really hard for the last three to four years you're getting 19 20 percent mm -hmm. per annum that those returns are not sustainable over the long term how are you advising or talking to your clients in terms of what are we going to be doing when we, we start normalizing in terms of returns well, one of the most important things we need to do, and by the way, Mark, I agree with you completely when it comes to the fact that the next three or four years will be fundamentally different. In fact, if you look at the last 10, with the exception of 2008, mm. they have been phenomenal. It's been pretty, pretty great going. So uh, the first thing is we need to align our expectations because the reality is it's not as if there are other asset classes out there in South Africa or around the world that are set to give us the phenomenal returns we've become accustomed to. So point number one, readjust your expectations. The world is set to shift going forward. Point number two, now more than ever, asset allocation and active asset allocation is becoming increasingly important. So it's no longer a question of sitting in equities for the long term, mm. but making sure that you benefit from those pockets of returns in asset classes as they come along and how adept you are at managing that process is said to be your key measure of success. But how do you have that discussion? Because you get 19% three, three, for three or four years in a row and then suddenly you say, but guys, six or 7% is more realistic. Do you not get pushback from your clients saying, well, maybe you're the wrong person to be managing my money then if that's the expectation that you're setting? Yeah, it's, a, it's a good old greed gene, yeah. isn't it? You know, if we, if we, we always want more. And there always is a risk from an advice perspective to migrate towards those that, that make us the best promises, you know, yeah. that, that, that best align the information with my expectation. Behavioral finance is something they call confirmation bias. I'll listen to information that confirms my own opinion, yeah. but anything to the contrary is obviously wrong. So I won't listen to that. So how do we apply this when it comes to advice and, and disappointing clients mm -hmm. when it comes to aligning their investment portfolios? Well, I've always believed that the single most important foundation for any investment management relationship is honesty. Mm -hmm. And that's not only honesty with each other, it's honesty with yourself in terms of how realistic your expectations are. So when it comes to those conversations, you have to ask yourself as an investor, would I rather have somebody tell me what I want to hear, mm. or am I going to be realistic, accept the fact that the world is going to change, and listen to how sound my financial advisor strategy is when it comes to aligning my portfolio to that environment? What, what are you telling uh, clients then that have uh, large exposure to emerging markets? Well, by and large, if, we, uh, if, you, if you're good at actively managing asset allocation, you know, hopefully you won't need to have that discussion once a year or once every other year. And that, that's always such a danger. I mean, if you mm -hmm. think of 2008, if you were seeing your financial advisor in June as opposed to in September, you would have had fundamentally different answers. Mm -hmm. So looking at those clients, 
who manage their own portfolios. Well, what you want to do on an ongoing basis, especially at times of uncertainty as this is, is you want to continuously adjust that asset allocation downwards, which in a way also then negates the question of do you see the market crashing or, or, or gradually adjusting? Well, if asset allocation happened all along and if you have been in emerging economies in the past, you want to see a gradual shift. Mm. And if that's not the case in your portfolio, well, maybe you want to rethink your portfolio management strategy altogether. Yeah. I'm sure there's still money to be made somewhere, even with the emerging market pressures. So whether it's you know within uh, specific asset classes or specific markets, where can value still be realized? Well, it's, it's, I was talking to Mark about this beforehand, and, and this has become such a really tough and challenging environment. Over the last 10 years, there were always great returns to be had elsewhere. It was easy to identify value, it was easy to identify opportunity, and the markets were running based on sound fundamentals without emotion having too much of an impact. Where do we go right now? Well, this, the, the answer to this question will probably change every two weeks or so. But certainly, in terms of our thinking, uh, we are hesitant at the moment in terms of emerging economies, looking more towards old economies. And uh, also one of the first investment lessons as, uh, as an asset manager many decades ago that I was taught was when your hairdresser tells you to buy something, yes, I did have a hairdresser. <laughs> Remember, it's probably the latest possible time to be selling it. So if you are going to rebalance your portfolio and, and stuff like fixed interest locally starts making mm. sense and you know, the interest rate cycle is turning. But what you want to think about is not what worked well in the last three to six months. That's always a bad basis for a decision. Rather ask yourself, over the period of my investment horizon, whether that be five or ten years, where is the value? And then try and forget about the short-term blips. Yeah, I mean, one of the questions we were chatting about off, off air a little bit is this idea about um, behavioral finance and, and sort of managing the expectations of, um, of clients. And one of the discussions that we had with a couple of the other asset managers and, and the, person, the, the financial planners was around small cap shares and taking bigger bets and riskier things and, and feeling that I can, take the, I can take greater risk because you keep telling, as an asset, ma um, asset manager, you've said to me, but my expectations must start coming down. So therefore, I look and I see, well, some small cap has now doubled over the last couple of weeks. I want to be able. To, I, I want a piece of that action. It almost seems to be a, a sense of boredom creeping in with some of the with some of the high net worth individuals. Mm -hmm. How do you cope with something like that? Well, boredom always is a threat. You know, but boredom and I guess loss aversion. We react twice as emotionally to losing money as we do to making money, and, and that's something to remember. If I am going to look at speculating, especially as a wealthy investor, if I've got a trillion rand, you know, however many zeros those are. The first question I need to ask myself is, of my trillion rand, how much money do I need to secure my lifestyle? Because that's always going to be boring five-day test cricket. Mm. And once you understand of my trillion, how much I need to secure that, whatever's left, well, those are your surplus assets. And you, you can afford to speculate with those. Because if you are going to speculate, to my mind, the single most important question you want to be asking yourself is, can I afford to lose this money? So if you want to speculate, by all means speculate, but first make sure mm. that you secure that portion of your wealth that needs to make sure that you're never ever going to become poor again. And make sure you've got a sound, boring, active asset, active asset allocation strategy behind that to help you hit the returns you need at a level of risk that you can live with. Okay, if you could give advice to someone who is not a high net worth individual, like me, oh, like a very, a very <laughs> medium worth individual. In terms of asset allocation, what should our portfolios look like at the moment? Um, when it comes to investment strategy in broad, my point of departure is it should always be, you know, if properly and responsibly managed, as aggressive as you feel comfortable with, provided that you've got the time. Because we must remember, when it comes to short-term asset behavior and long-term asset behavior, those are two very different pictures. I mean, my chances of losing money in the all she index over you know, this year or any other year is one in four. But mm. over 10 and 15 year periods, my odds of losing money become very minuscule indeed. So from an asset allocation perspective, I'm very hesitant of those rules of thumb that sort of take your age and subtract that from 100 and you know, do an appropriate equity allocation on the back end of that. Rule of thumb would be firstly understand the return you need your assets to generate. Um, once you understand that, understand the range of returns that that implies and the portfolio behavior that implies over the short term and the long term. And once you understand in a bad year what can happen, and if you're okay with that, try and go as aggressive as you are. And then one day, when you start drawing an income 
from your portfolio at retirement or possibly prior to that, then you can start looking at maybe being a little bit more conservative mm. to, to balance out a lot of the volatility risk mm. uh, entailed in drawing an income out of a market-based portfolio. I haven't answered your questions at all, but especially prior to drawing an income, mm. as aggressive as you can, but don't be reckless. If we were to look at broader uh, economic market data, I mean, oftentimes that people say that if you're playing on the stock exchange, don't look at what the economy broadly is doing and don't listen to analysis about the economy. These are two very different worlds that aren't always aligned and are not always mirror reflections of each other. But it's quite difficult uh, to do that at a time where, you know, there's a lot of talk about the impact of not only QE, but China becomes another factor. A, a person who's a, a trillionaire or potential trillionaire, if there are economic market data indicators they should be looking at. Which ones are those? If you can't look at everything, but what should you be tracking right now? Well, in, in behavioral finance, there's something called framing. You know, it's basically the context and the window through which you look at information. So my point of departure when it comes to what information do I look at would be, uh, firstly, make sure it's aligned with your investment period. So mm -hmm. if, for example, I'm going to need this money or invest with this money for the next 20 or 30 years, make sure the information I track is appropriate. Sure, you need to have a sound global economic outlook. Um, but always also remember that it makes sense to predominantly invest in the currency you're going to spend. Mm. So if I'm going to be spending South African rands or US dollars, I want my macroeconomic outlooks to align to that currency and the time frame within that economy that makes sense. So for example, you know, equities in South Africa for a 24 month investors right now, not too sure. For a 24 year investor, it's a no brainer. Your mm. asset allocation won't change very much at all. So do you see the picture getting better? Sorry, Mark, I just jumped in there. Uh, do you see, do you think that we're seeing the last of currency volatility f in the short term uh, for emerging markets and that it would be <laughs> a good idea to stick with uh, some of these emerging market currencies? That's a very topical question. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to answer that question by saying that emerging market currency volatility has always been with us. Um, this year especially, it's probably said to get worse than it was in recent history. Uh, we are going to an election year. We are seeing the impact of fiscal tapering on emerging markets and a number of other considerations. Um, and right now, you know, certainly there is a lot of uh, argument to support around maybe being slightly undervalued. Um, so if I'm going to invest in a currency and look at currency, the question I should rather be asking is, what is my long-term call on that currency? And mm. stick to that framework, because over time, your currency is going to depreciate roughly in line with the difference in inflation, the inflation rate differential between our economy and the economy of the other currency you're looking at. Prior to this year, you know, 18 months or so ago, the average depreciation of the rand against the dollar was about five, five and a half percent per annum, and long-term, if inflation rates stay steady, and of course after the budget we know in South Africa they will, um, yeah, <laughs> rather stick to that average. And when the blips happen, and they are going to happen, forget about it. Accept long term what's going to happen, and mm. it will even out to give you that result. So I guess in one of the questions around currency, and, and, and I know this is, it's putting you on the spot a little bit from it, but what currency do you, what what constitutes a hard currency then if you're talking to your clients do we say do we base it on a dollar dollar exposure or do we carry on taking emerging market exposure how do you position it from a from an allocation toward currency perspective for, in, in terms of assets boy you see you're going to put me on the spot and you, and you certainly did what i won't give you is a straight answer yep. but but let's look at the principle behind this thing Investing successfully is about understanding pockets of value when they happen and being able to profit from those pockets of value. So when something is cheap, buy it. When something is expensive, sell it. And the great thing about the investment environment today is that you can, you can make use of currency overlays. So I can buy the US market in rands, mm. for example. Um, it is no longer necessary to peg yourself to a currency mm. based on the economy you want to invest in. And that means that in the short term, you know, especially if there are drastic pockets of overall undervaluation in emerging market currencies, and we will find them over the next year or two, um, look at the currencies in isolation and, and sure, you know, hedge where you can, but don't be reckless because mm. currencies are hugely volatile, hugely emotional. Um, what does that mean in South African context? Well. Is this the right time to be buying the dollar? Well, a year ago, it would have been a very simple discussion. Mm. Now, maybe the converse would apply. What about cash? In the cash, in the role of your, uh, from an asset allocation perspective, South African rand denominated cash. What's the role of that in a portfolio at the moment? The one argument being that if you keep cash aside and there is a, a sharp pullback, you'll have some so-called dry powder to be able to get, to profit from those 
Do you, do you believe that cash still has a role to play in a high net worth individual's investment portfolio? Well, from a, for firstly, from a matching perspective, it makes sense. So if I know I am going to buy a new yacht or a new private jet, um, I know one of us was saying before, and we were looking at doing that next year, <laughs> um, I, I won't say who, um, then sure, I mean, it makes no sense to put your money in an investment vehicle or in an asset class that will be volatile in the short term. Um, so, so, so matching it in the short term does make sense. Over the long term, let's look at the dry powder argument. Mm. If you're going to uh, be good and effective at actively managing your asset allocation, you actually don't really need that dry powder because slowly you're moving the powder across as those opportunities, as those opportunities come up. So does that mean that being in cash right now is, is a bit of a dead waste? Well, let's face it, you know, interest rates are going up, yeah. but they, we certainly don't expect them you know, to, to, in the short term, at least go back to 1990s type odd levels. Um, Rather, you know, take a long-term view on an asset class and get your exposure and ignore the short-term movements and, and you'll be fine. And save yourself a lot of stress and get some extra sleep in the process. <laughs> maybe I'll, take you, I'll, I'll, I'll take, you, take you the spotlight off you for a moment and maybe turn around and say, you're talking to your clients regularly. They're obviously high net worth individuals and they, they understand what's happening in the South African and international business context. What's worrying them at the moment in terms of, uh, in terms of their strategy and, and, and the outlook for 2014? Well, um, aside from the, the, the short-term concerns, you spoke about the currency, we spoke about the local economy. Um, really one of the challenges is, as we mentioned earlier on, historically it used to be much easier to move your money elsewhere to sustain higher portfolio returns. And right now the question clients are asking, and in fact they're not alone, investment managers are asking the same question, is where do I go to sustain strong returns? Mm. Um, because the reality is that's become a very tough question to answer. Um, certainly it's almost impossible to answer decidedly in the short term. And on the back end of that, um, you know, if I am coming off high valuations, and let's look at the South African, um, at the South African index and mm. stock market and, and, and a number of, of similar economies, um, we're coming off a high base. How do I protect myself against that? And for the first time in ages, on the back end of that, something like the bond market is starting to look attractive mm. again. So right now, to summarize, if I'm going to invest my money, I can try and focus on one of two things. Either to try and get the highest returns I can, or to get the returns I need with as little risk as possible. And the latter strategy right now is making a great deal of sense. And that is the question that more sophisticated investors are starting to ask. Henry, before we let you go, very quickly, if, we, if one was a very high net worth individual and they have some excess uh, funds and they just wanted to play a little, which areas would you say, even if they were really high risk, could be um, explosively profitable? If you had a couple of hundred million <laughs> dollars to throw around, where would that be? If you could play with that. I was saying to Mark earlier on, watch me use five years of law school to artfully dodge questions. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and I shall now attempt to do that. Um, if you really are going to, to speculate and make emotional bets, um, your, your options as far as that concern change on almost an ongoing basis. Certainly if you look at more sophisticated investors, aside from having a, a wealth preservation strategy, um, they tend to have a private share or discretionary share portfolios, often including derivatives and all the rest. You know, where does your stockbroker fit in? You know, those guys that will advise you on sort of where to speculate and the weird and wonderful things to do. Well, 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 it sort of fits into that part of the picture, your surplus capital. And as far as those opportunities are concerned, you know, they're always abound. But if you're really wealthy, if you really want to make money, the reason why you're wealthy is because you're very good at what you're doing. You'd probably be best off by reinvesting it in your business. I mean, I think Henry made an interesting point just before we, uh, off air was the worst thing that, that, that could possibly happen is that the, the, you speculate and make some money because I think that what happens then is you end up taking the bets, they get bigger and bigger. It, it, it's quite interesting. It, it comes down to behavioral, uh, behavioral finance, mm -hmm. which I think has been a theme that we've been carrying through for the last couple of, a couple of weeks. Uh, very much so. Um, and, and in fact, even if you are going to take a, take a chance with a pocket, if that works, the question we start asking is, but hang on, why don't I do that for all of my money? Mm -hmm. And you know, in, on that road lays financial ruin. That is the simple bottom line. And if you're going to be greedy about it, and if you want to take food off the table when there's none to be had, it's probably not going to end up, end up well for you regardless of how wealthy you are. Well, suffice to remind us that uh, none of us around this desk are trillionaires or <laughs> multi-dollar millionaires or billionaires for that matter. Henry, thank you though for making the time to join us. That's Henry van de Venter, Head of Business Development at Axis.